faculty seminar, I have to thank the few colleagues present in the room and lots of students in the room for great attendance. Uh, welcome to the opening edition of the faculty seminar for this semester. And this first seminar is an occasion for enormous celebration. We've already held four seminars in this series about the books that our colleagues have published. So this is the fifth one. And yet again, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, this seminar will focus, will center on a book published by a colleague. Uh, we'll be discussing ideas of Kalsberg's recent publication, Limits of the Secular, Social Experience and Cultural Memory. Many congratulations, sir. You would know by talking to Kalsberg informally that he's been concerned about the issues that he will talk about today for some time. He's been saying that uh, today, in today's world, we've created an opposition between inner experience and outer reality, and this opposition is unnecessary. That we focus on the outer without the recognition of the inner, and that this creates damaged lives, and that the privatizing of the transcendental is done in such a way that it leads to a loss of lived wisdom. It creates social malady on the one hand, and extremism and fundamentalism on the other. Now, these are very significant claims to make, and I think it's a very, very important issue, especially in today's uh, day and age. Uh, I really look forward to the seminar. I just have to remind you of a couple of other things. We all know what Kalsav teaches, curriculum studies, sociology of education, sociology more generally, philosophy sometimes, but I want to tell you that he received his PhD from the Michigan State University, and he's also taught at the Louisiana State University at Baton Rouge for several years before coming to APU. Uh, more importantly, this is his third book. The first one was in 2005, Teachers in Nomadic Spaces, and the second one, Neighborhoods, War, Politics, and Education, published in 2009. So over to you, Kalsa. And uh, welcome to you, and we are very happy that uh, this is a great occasion when, when you will be speaking about your recent book. No. Uh, to say that I have written a book is always for me a very strange um, claim because when I go back I don't find that me who wrote it. I'm unable to locate that person who wrote, apparently wrote a book and I don't know what that claim really means uh, and I thought about it and I thought about it and I said to myself probably a better way to put it is that the book was written upon me rather than the book was written upon uh, me as the um, medium or the parchment on which the book was written. And I can't really say who or what wrote that book because I can't repeat that effort. I can, repeat, I can do another effort, but I can't repeat. I can't rewrite this book if I was asked to do it because that energy is gone. I can't find it. That's one thing. The second thing is that there are two, multiple ways of reading a book. One way is to examine the book and what's being said from the categories that you know. That is, I have in my possession certain kinds of epistemological, philosophical, and other categories through which I examine something that has been thrown at me. But what happens when you are examining the categories themselves? And then that becomes a problem because you no longer are, you are able to uh, examine the, what is being said from the categories that you know. Part of the problem with this book is that, that it examines those very categories through which we look. And what I will request you to do for a small short while, about 30 minutes or so of my talk, 
after which we can discuss, is that you can set aside the categories through which you have been used to looking at things. And otherwise, they will not permit you to even, even briefly touch upon what I'm trying to communicate. So that's the other thing. <clears throat> um, some of the stuff that I came upon in doing the research for this book were uh, profoundly unsettling, profoundly disturbing. I may, and uh, also at the same time, very profoundly moving and, uh, and uplifting too. This book was probably in the writing for many, many years, like Sir pointed out just now, Anilji. Uh, it, the, the, the writing of it does not reflect the kind of engagement with those ideas that I've had for many years now. Um, so let's begin by, I'll just put out there for you, uh, very a brief, uh, you know, skeletal, um, you know, structure of the book's argument, and because we have, I don't want to go on and on, we could rather have you people, we all have a started discussion rather than me going on speaking. But I'll just put the bare bones of the book out there. It starts with looking at the um, a, a peculiar phenomenon that has been in the make for the last, say, 1,500 years or so, which is the, idea, the, the, the uh, phenomenon of the concept. You know, we all know what a concept is, right? And the modern world is dominated by the concept. We can't even imagine the world without concept because everything in the making seems to be through concept. Conceptual, you know, you hear, hear it all the time, concept, concept. There are even concept cars out there. Even uh, mobile phones are today concept phones, right? <laughs> but the concept seems to completely dominate our existence. Uh, and here, there are two kinds, of course, there are technological concepts, concepts that manage the modification of material, and concepts that manage our lives in social and humanistic terms. So I'm going to talk about the latter a little bit and see how it all links up to the, the title of the book. <clears throat> So, coming back to the management of our lives through concept, begin, begin to examine it. And I see that there was a time when concepts did not, uh, did not dominate our lives the way they do today. There were always, always there was concept, but they didn't dominate our lives the way it did, does today. Concept comes from the word conceive, to give birth. Now, what gives birth? Of course, the organism gives birth, but what gives birth to the concept? Because it comes from the word con to conceive. Um, so, That's where I begin, the book begins to take a look at modernity, because modernity is obsessed with the concept. It is based in concept. It, is, it, uh, it uh, prides itself on, on the multiplicity of concepts and so on. So, the, so I begin my examination with looking at the rising of the concept. Okay. And when I look at it, more deeper I look at it, I see, my God, concept has become a fetish. The concept is become a fetish. You know, understand the word fetish? Many of you are here. The concept, you know, uh, Marx talked about commodity fetishism. And I, in this book, I talk about the concept fetishism. 
the uh, overweening influence of the, of the concept in our lives. And, like, and it will become clear as I move on why I'm talking about this. Take the question of uh, one of the major uh, items in the human lexicon which has bothered us you know, through centuries, the idea of freedom. Freedom as a concept, right? Now, if you go back in time, freedom in most major cultures was not a concept. Today it's a concept, a concept we fight about. Different people have different ideas of what freedom is. Whereas in antiquity, in many major traditions, there was no, uh, no uh, two opinions about what freedom meant. It meant surrender of your will to the divine power of one kind or another. It meant complete surrender of uh, my personality or my idea uh, of my uh, being to something that is transcendental. All right? Over time, that wo the word freedom undergoes a conceptual conceptualization. It undergoes intellectualization and becomes something very different, emerges as something very different, emerges as a contended concept. concept. Now, if you look at the word freedom very carefully, it means that it means one of the, one of the ways of looking and thinking about it is um, the exercise of free will. The exercise of free will. Now, you go back uh, to Shankara, for instance, and look at Sankara, and, uh, and he's uh, giving a commentary on the Upanishads, and he's writing about free will, and he says, yes, of course you have free will, but if you take the sum of all free wills, it is zero. In other words, free will is there for the individual, but if you take all the free wills together, it becomes nullity. Just as if you take all the energy in the world, positive, negative, it ends up with a zero. That physicists know very well. And Shankara knew that, Will is evident to the individual, but if you, take, if, if you take my will as some alpha one, there will always be in the universe some negative alpha one, and when you add there, <laughs> you will get a zero. So yes, uh, when, so, so, but, but this, uh, uh, this controversy about whether human beings have free will or not takes hold of the Western culture and becomes a major conceptual battle. Whether do we, are we determined, we are determined, we have free will and this and that. So much of uh, Western philosophy becomes obsessed with the conceptual, this thing of free will. <clears throat> Whereas uh, in, 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 in the 8th century, Shankara tells us very clearly that there is free will and there isn't. <laughs> Ultimately, there is no, no such thing as free will, meaningless. But you may have an illusion of free will. You may delude yourself that there is free will and continue to behave in that manner. Anyway, so I, if I begin to examine some of the concepts that, a man, that I've been managing, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, be, I began by looking into this book, for starting this book, I began to look at some of the concepts that manage rational modernity. All right? Some of the concepts that manage rational freedom, uh, another uh, major term that manages modern life has been managing modern life, uh, uh, managing the ideas the, of, of, of the ec modern economic life since the 17th century, which is the idea of scarcity. You know, scarcity. Economics, you know, most of classical and neoclassical economics will collapse if you take away the word scarcity. There'll be no economics. So there has to be a, there was a fundamental concept that was drilled into human consciousness that was scarcity. Because with scarcity, there was a concomitant idea which is called unlimited want. How do you manage unlimited want? Vis-a-vis -vis scarcity and therefore economics comes out of that, of management of resources. Now, which I ask you this question, which rational animal or any part of a rational animal ever has unlimited want? Does the heart have unlimited want? No. Does the brain have unlimited want? No. It has limited want for glucose. The heart has limited want of oxygen. 
If you give it more, it will die. If you give it less, it will die. It has a regulated need of, so there's no such thing in this world called unlimited want. And therefore, there's no such thing in this world as scarcity. It was a concept manufactured. It was a concept that was manufactured and transplanted as truth. Therefore, when you, uh, when you the entire, and I look at it and, and I find it's shocking as to how a, an, a, 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 a misleading concept called um, um, scarcity becomes a foundational notion of the entire body of economic thought. I, I, can't, I, I, do, I can't go more into it, I wish I could, but uh, you will find that more in the book, right? I examine these concepts, uh, concepts of freedom, concept of scarcity, concepts of equality, concept of justice. The more I look into these uh, foundational notions of mod modern life, mo modern human human humanism, I see that they all turn out to be hollow, hollow concepts, but uh, having a, a lot of investment in it. Enormous sentimental investment in those concepts because, because a certain kind of society was coming out of that. A certain kind of uh, understanding of what, what it means to live in this world, what is a being in this world, was coming out of those managerial concepts that were being manufactured in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. So therefore, I begin the book with an examination of the concept. And, the, and I call it concept fetishism, because as I examine, I see that concepts are fetishized. They are not really examined for the truth. They are, they are posited and then accepted and may, may become part of the truth uh, propositions of this world. All right? So I begin there. <clears throat> and then I look back from that point of uh, the rise of the concept. concept uh, and I've also... Um, Used another word in the book, which is hypostasis. Hypostasis means you make something um, uh, you you, you make, it, make make something uh, stasis means bringing it to a um, foundational you know uh, strength and hy hypo on that which stands on top. Uh, hypo standing on top, stasis meaning that which has become now stabilized. All right. So the concept becomes hypostasized, made, made into a stable, stable platform on which we can build what we call modern humanity. So hypostasis or uh, concept fetishism, I use these interchangeably throughout. Now when I look back and I go back and I say, where did it all start? Concept meaning conceiving, who conceived, what conceived this? All right? Look back and back and back and I find that every major culture whether the Judeo-Christian, the Islamic, or the Hindu, and so on, so forth, Egyptian, and, and, and beyond, uh, had moments of what I've called singularity. A moment of singularity. In a moment of singularity, there is no concept. Right? There is an outburst of pure, I don't know what, I don't want to call it energy, something else. The birth of the Christ was one such thing, the resurrection. The coming of the Muhammad was one such moment. There were moments where the, where the messiahs brought with them, the, the great um, sages brought with them moments of singularity. They did not demand any interpretation, did not demand any conceptual category. You could feel it then and there. The compassion was bursting out as it was there. Real. You don't have to read it to understand what the Christ was saying. In his presence, you could feel what he was saying. So there were the moments of singularity. Those singularities were not concept free. Right? They did not need concept. So therefore, I had to find a place from where I could look at the concept. And therefore, historically, I pushed back and I said, are there moments where life is free of concept? And I found, yes, there are. And it's not that there's some uh, new finding. It has always been there, right? Everybody knows. I just put it in a way that it gave, gave me a platform to examine the concept. And that platform was the platform of singularity. Singularity means where there are no multiplicity. There is no interpretation. There is no conflict about what that moment means. It is a moment of the now. Right now, 
there's nothing, right? And then there's an explosion in the now. It is not the time of the clock, but the time of the now, all right? And therefore, I have, and now I have my platform to look at concept, examine concept. And I say that, no, no, do I need a concept to examine concept? Well, sometimes I did, because you can't really look at concept purely from singularity. How do I enter singularity? Right? How do you enter that singularity? Those moments are not so easily available to us. All right. So therefore, the rise of the concept and it's, it's the, the way of the, 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 the uh, microscope that I looked, that, that I wanted, the analytical mo uh, movement that I wanted to uh, find for myself was given in the, in the notion of the singularity, which did not require concept. All right. Now, <clears throat> I will now increase the pace of my uh, talk so that we have time in the end to talk, discuss and not take too much time. All right. <clears throat> so when I look at when I looked at um, uh, at the process of conceiving, you know, as I said, con concept comes from conceiving. Now, when I looked at that process of conceiving, now. How? Where? Singularity at one point begins to cool down. Right? You cannot maintain that, that, that um, explosive energy. It begins to cool down. And when it cools, singularity gives birth to multiplicity. Now there are multiple views of what the presence of the Christ meant, what resurrection meant, what this and that, and so on and so forth, right? At that moment, there was no debate about what that moment meant. But soon after, soon after the singularity begins to cool down, like a, you know, like, uh, uh, um, what is that, that uh, volcano. A volcano, when it begins to cool down, then you have structures forming. But the lava itself is different, right? The explosion itself is different. And so the, 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 singularity, the moment singularity begins to die down is replaced by multiplicity in the sense of there are now different debates about what the resurrection meant. And here I'm del deliberately referring to using Latin Christendom as my, uh, as my uh, lens because modernity is, is nothing but coming out of uh, Christianity. If you, don't, if you do not understand the Bible, you do not understand Christianity, you cannot understand modernity. Because there's a direct, the birth of modernity is from Latin Christendom. That's my understanding, and that's the, another thesis that I, sub-thesis that I go through in the book. Anyway, so, <clears throat> um, as singularity gives birth, conceives, becomes cold, dies, and is, you, its, its original thrust is gone and dead, now you have multiple views, multiple understandings, multiple debates, multiple concepts coming out of that. And that is, the next stage of that is what's called sometimes, not always, uh, theodicy. Meaning all kinds of religious intellectualization of a moment all kinds of intellectual um, explanations of what that phenomena meant for us, what, what the uh, X, Y, Z means in terms. So there's a, there's a great, now it's replaced by a great deal of intellectual debate hmm, about what a, a particular uh, messianic or um, some other uh, uh, um, in, incredible phenomena, phenomenon meant in terms of ordinary grasping. We want to grasp. We want to grasp things, yeah? we want to make, make sense of things. Earlier, that moment, you could not make sense of it. There was no need to make sense of it. Now, there is a grasping, the need to grasp. <clears throat> grasping comes. Right? So, the uh, original force of singularity is now replaced by secular thought of grasping. I mean, seculum, the word seculum means of this world. It literally means of this age, or of, as uh, explained by Augustine in the third century. Um, seculum. Of 
or age of this world or age and there is the other world that the Messiah brings with him or her right which is quickly lost and now you want to grasp you want to make sense of what happened and there is a 1000 thousand years of debate between Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas there is 1300 years of debate about uh, sorry uh, third century 12th century yeah well yeah a thousand years of debate about what that phenomena of the Christ actually meant now in the 21st century all that is very far away right now it seems like it does not matter what has that got to do with it this is all part of cultural memory right very far away it has it has no apparently no relevance to our lives but my argument my central argument in this book is that it does have relevance and it has so much relevance that it is so profoundly relevant that we do not want to face it part of the argument of the book is that it is so pro it is not something that can be separated by number of years merely because i'm not talking you know why am i talking about the about a particular phenomenon because it just lends itself to my analysis it could e i could easily talk think about this in terms of the egyptian or in terms of the mayan or in terms of the uh, upanishadic time and so on here i examine latin christendom because modernity is under my lens and modernity is not the product of egyptians Modern is not the product of the mayans not the product of really the upanishadic thought it is a product of a certain kind of conversion of christianity a secularization of christianity right it is a secularized christianity that we see today as modernity now therefore a quick a quick point here the idea that secularism is something that is you know uh, a separation of church and state or public governance and private faith and so on is peddled to us as though it happened in 17th century or 16th century that is not true my examination shows that this began in the third century the separation of church and state began not as separation of church and state by but by the intellectualization of Christianity which began to happen very early very very early right where the, uh, the 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 deep faith was gradually pushed aside and what came about is how do you manage this life seculum and that happened very early did not happen where we usually are tra trained to think that it happened in 16th 17th centuries right that separation began between being and action being the, being the transcendental and the empirical that division began to appear in human history much before uh, with the timing that is placed in our uh, usual discourses so therefore this this is another part of the book that there is a cleavage there is a cleavage now between that moment of singularity and what it asked and the moment of singularity said one thing it says it said do not forget throughout early Christianity you see this word anamnesis amnesia means to forget right Anams anamnesis means do not forget what are they asking us not to forget what is Paul saying over and over again to the Thessalonians to the Romans to his letters and so on he says do not forget that moment of singularity that is the core on, alone on which you can base your life right anamnesis right anamnesis so there is this cleavage in 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 Gre the Greeks called that the, the the Greeks who were influenced by Christianity they called it this gap katagma katagma means a split a hiatus a sudden break hmm? and we are now the victims of that break we our culture our civilization everything that we know is in that break in that split in the katagma because we have uh, not listened we means not we I mean we as human beings have not listened to that anamnesis we have said let that singularity go and we can manage our lives perfectly well without that singularity 
And that, there is a word for that. And that word is called humanism. All of you know that word. <clears throat> The doctrine of humanism says we don't need to refer to the singularity. We can manage our own affairs with our own concepts. Hmm? It started very early in the church. The church fathers decided that they did not need the true faith anymore. They could start thinking about uh, divine will in a different way. Divine will now could be managed. So they separated, they, they, they made a, uh, what is called the the tripart, you know the tripartite structure? What is that? Everybody here knows. The Trinity, exactly. They pushed the spirit out some, somewhere. Esotericized it and pushed it away. And then brought uh, the tripartite structure. Now allowed them through uh, it, uh, people like Tertullian and others who first posited it. Uh, some of the church fathers were extremely disturbed by this attempt to separate this, to produce this katagma. They said, no, we can't do that. But the ones who won, won, won over the church were the ones who posited the tripartite trinitarian structure. Right? And now, so, so when I go back and look as to what produces the seculum, what is the root moment when singularity begins to conceive concept through which today we manage our lives, right? And I see that that kathagma is the root. Philosophically, that is the root of the moment when we do not no longer pay attention to the singularity. We say it is not important. What is important is that this world and not the other world. Now, how much time? I have spent about 30 minutes, right? Yeah. I have 10 minutes, sir? Yeah. Okay. <sighs> Okay. Now, it is not difficult to understand if you have, if you are with me, I have already not thrown out this as some kind of crazy, uh, cr you know, crazed discourse that I have, you know, pet ideas that I am throwing at you. If you have just for a few moments kept aside your categories, it's not difficult to understand that a katagma, a, sp a profound split between being and action is going to produce a partial reality, right? A partial reality. It is not going to be the whole reality. We will not be able to respond to this world in a holistic way. We will be only be responding to the world with, with a certain partiality, with a certain fragment, because it's a fragment that presents itself to us. And that fragment is what we today call the secular, the secular fragment, right? So therefore, the, the katagma produces, and this is what I have argued in the book, a partial reality, which then masquerades, the partial reality now masquerades as the whole reality. You, you are taught that that's all there is. Look at our curriculum. Look at the way we design our development programs. It's all about that part, not the other part. We do not take into account, we do not take Kabir seriously. We historicize him. We make it, make all philosophy a, 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 a philosophy of history or history of philosophy. We don't take it, we don't say, what is the challenge that Kabir threw at us? Let's look at it. Right? Right, sir? We don't, look, we don't say that. We don't say that, let, let us look at what, is, what exactly is the challenge that Muhammad threw us. We historicize it. And then we go past it. And then we say, let's find the new solution to our lives. This, <laughs> do, you, do you see the game? We are endlessly running away from the, sol the profound solutions that were already given. And, and then we say, from, through the fragment, through the partial reality, we say, let's find, oh, we have a problem. Of course, you bet we have a problem. The problem is not, you know, we have a problem. The problem is really that we have ignored the Ecclesias. Another word that I... We have ignored the call. This is Ecclesias, Greek for the call, also Latin. We have ignored the call. 
the, the prophets, the messiahs always called us to resolve our problems. Socrates told us what, said what the examined life was. But we did not, we normally, what do we do? We hang our prophets. We poison them, we hang them, or we make them commit, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, 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 because uh, Now, in the 21st century, all that is very far away, right? Now it seems like it does not matter. What has that got to do with it? This is all part of cultural memory, right? Very far away. It has, it has no, apparently, no relevance to our lives. But my argument, my central argument in this book is that it does have relevance. And it has so much relevance that it is so profoundly relevant that we do not want to face it. Part of the argument of the book is that it is so pro it is not something that can be separated by number of years. Merely because I'm not talking. You know, why am I talking about the about a particular phenomenon? Because it just lends itself to my analysis. It could e I could easily talk think about this in terms of the Egyptian, or in terms of the Mayan, or in terms of the uh, Upanishadic time and so on. Here I examine Latin Christendom because modernity is under my lens, and modernity is not the product of Egyptians. Modern, it's not the product of the Mayans, not the product of really the Upanishadic thought. It is a product of a certain kind of conversion of Christianity, a secularization of Christianity. Right? It is a secularized Christianity that we see today as modernity. Now, therefore, a quick, a quick point here. The idea that secularism is something that is, you know, uh, a separation of church and state or public governance and private faith and so on is peddled to us as though it happened in 17th century or 16th century. That is not true. My examination shows that this began in the 3rd century. The separation of church and state began not as separation of church and state by, but by the intellectualization of Christianity, which began to happen very early. Very, very early, right? Where the, uh, the, the, the deep faith was gradually pushed aside. And what came about is, how do you manage this life, seculum? And that happened very early. Did not happen where we usually are tra trained to think that it happened in 16th, 17th centuries, right? That separation began between being and action, being the, being the transcendental and the empirical. That division began to appear in human history much before uh, with the timing that is placed in our uh, usual discourses. So therefore this, this is another part of the book that there is a cleavage. There is a cleavage now between that moment of singularity and what it asked. And the moment of singularity said one thing. It says, it said, do not forget. Throughout early Christianity, you see this word. Anamnesis. Amnesia means to forget, right? Anamnesis means do not forget. What are they asking us not to forget? What is Paul saying over and over again to the Thessalonians, to the Romans, to his letters and so on? He says, do not forget that moment of singularity. That is the core on, alone on which you can base your life. Right? Anamnesis. Right? Anamnesis. So there is this cleavage. In, in, in Gre the Greeks called that, the, the, the Greeks who were influenced by Christianity, they called it this gap, katagma. Katagma means a split, a hiatus, a sudden break. Hmm? And we are now the victims of that break. We, our culture, our civilization, everything that we know is in that break, in that split, in the katagma. Because we have uh, not listened. We means not we. I mean we as human beings have not listened to that anamnesis. We have said, let that singularity go. And we can manage our lives perfectly well without that singularity. And that, there is a word for that. And that word is called humanism. All of you know that word.
the doctrine of humanism says we don't need to refer to the singularity. We can manage our own affairs with our own concepts. Hmm? It started very early in the church. The church fathers decided that they did not need the true faith anymore. They could start thinking about uh, divine will in a different way. Divine will now could be managed. So they separated, they, they, they made a, uh, what is called the, the tripartite, you know the tripartite structure? What is that? Everybody here knows. The Trinity, exactly. They pushed the spirit out some, somewhere. Esotericized it and pushed it away. And then brought uh, the tripartite structure. Now allowed them through uh, it, uh, people like Tertullian and others who first posited it. Uh, some of the church fathers were extremely disturbed by this attempt to separate this, to produce this katagma. They said, no, we can't do that. But the ones who won, won, won over the church were the ones who posited the tripartite trinitarian structure, right? And now, so, so when I go back and look as to what produces the seculum, what is the root moment when singularity begins to conceive concept through which today we manage our lives, right? And I see that that katagma is the root. Philosophically, that is the root of the moment when we do not no longer pay attention to the singularity. We say it is not important. What is important is that this world and not the other world. Now, how much time? I have spent about 30 minutes, right? Yes. I have 10 minutes, sir? Yes. Okay. <sighs> okay. Now, it is not difficult to understand. If you, have, if you are with me, I have already not thrown out this as some kind of crazy, uh, cr you know, crazed discourse that I have, you know, pet ideas that I am throwing at you. If you have just for a few moments kept aside your categories, it is not difficult to understand that a katagma, a, sp a profound split between being and action is going to produce a partial reality. A partial reality. It is not going to be the whole reality. We will not be able to respond to this world in a holistic way. We will be only be responding to the world with, with a certain partiality, with a certain fragment, because it's a fragment that presents itself to us. And that fragment is what we today call the secular, the secular fragment. Right? So therefore, the, the katagma produces, and this is what I have argued in the book, a partial reality which then masquerades, the partial reality now masquerades as the whole reality. You, you are taught that that's all there is. Look at our curriculum. Look at the way we design our development programs. It's all about that part, not the other part. We do not take into account, we do not take Kabir seriously. We historicize him. We make it, make all philosophy a, 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 a philosophy of history or history of philosophy. We don't take it, we don't say, what is the challenge that Kabir threw at us? Let's look at it. Right? Right, sir? We don't, look, we don't say that. We don't say that, let's, let's look at what, is, what exactly is the challenge that Muhammad threw us. We historicize it. And then we go past it. And then we say, let's find the new solution to our lives. This, <laughs> do, you, do you see the game? We are endlessly running away from the, sol the profound solutions that were already given. And, and then we say, from, through the fragment, through the partial reality, we say, let's find, oh, we have a problem. Of oh, course, you bet we have a problem. The problem is not, <laughs> you understand, we have a problem. And the problem is really that we have ignored the glacias. Another word that I... <sighs> we have ignored the call. This is ecclesias, Greek for the call, also Latin. We have ignored the call. The, the, the prophets, the messiahs always called us to resolve our problems. Socrates told us what, said what the examined life was. But we did not, we normally, what do we do? We hang our prophets. We poison them. 
we hang them or we make them commit <laughs> you know uh, so 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 because uh, make them drink poison ivy whatever right because uh, it's, it's 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 too much the demand is too much and then after having given up on those demands after having discarded those demands we then want to look for solutions to our problems and my argument in this book is that there is no solution i'm sorry and this probably angers most of my uh, listeners when i say that there is no solution to our lives if you base try to base your solution on a partial reality you're always going to have what a partial solution and a partial solution always is conflicted it's almost mathematical physical right if you have if you base your solutions on on a, on a partial reality there are other parts will oppose this reality and you'll never be able to solve so what we are trying to do is what what we cannot do we in other words when you when you base your educational problems your developmental problems your uh, problems of war and peace hmm? uh, your problems of uh, sexuality your problems of uh, psychic depression your problems of suicide your problem every all that you are looking at only a partial reality and that partial reality can never give whole the whole solution because the other part of the solution lies somewhere else and this one of the persons who saw this very clearly and and i rely a lot on, on him is carl jung some of you may have heard huh? carl gustav jung who was a who was a um, swiss german whatever whatever austria uh, you know uh, um psychoanalysis coming out from the freudian school but then developing his own theory right so uh, one of the people there is a lot of jungian thought in my book in this book not my book in this book it's it's very silly to say my book i don't know what my book means uh, yeah it the book rests on so many shoulders so many th rich thoughts so many people to whom the book is indebted my book is just a conventional way of identifying a book that's all nothing more than that and so um, yeah jung talks about that about that katagma and he says one thing very interesting he says in all my life all the um, major psychiatric patients that i met who were above the age of 30 their problems were always religious problems in the sense of their root of the problem lay not in the empirical but in the other domain so if this is the empirical domain and this is the transcendental domain he makes a categorical statement he says all those patients that i have met and dealt with their problems really were religious problems not finding the other part not now please do not understand religion here in the narrow dogmatic uh you know institutionalized sense of the word religion it's me it means religious religiosity that which looks back into the singularity that which has the courage to face the singularity right that's what he said and and he said those who resolved their problems invariably resolved it in a religious way and so it's a very categorical statement and you can find it i have the the i have references to that statement so this is basically the bare bones structure of the book what it talks about in the end is something called <coughs> metanoia or metanoic practice metanoic practice is as meta in you know in greek means beyond and noic means ways of you know knowing yourself so metanoia would mean going beyond the usual ways of you knowing yourself all right so how do you do that how do you stretch yourself how do you stretch yourself to go beyond yourself that is the challenge that the book poses which means that it asks us to examine our categories and then and then take a step beyond those categories and how do you do that and that i discuss is in a, in a an idea called um not an idea it's not an idea it is a uh, embodied practice 
which I uh, have named as bridge consciousness. So therefore, there is this katagma that you see, that you have seen. Now, it, it is not possible for us today to immediately deny this katagma, this uh, split, and then become whole. That is a pie in the sky. That doesn't work like that. One has to retrace one step. One, those who are serious about this, those who want to even consider this as a serious possibility, they will have, we will have to retrace our steps in some specified ways. And those specified ways are nothing very, very esoteric or very unknown. They are known to every culture. Every culture has, a, has a metanoic practices embedded in it. Only we have disregarded it. It has not become part of our curriculum. One day a student came and asked me, and I cannot ever forget that question. She said, sir, is love important in development? <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I, I said, love is the only development there is. And then she said, um, one of your you know, seniors probably, so then why don't we teach about it or talk about it? Uh, <laughs> that is a question to which I had no answer. I could not uh, answer that question. Uh, so um, the bridge, bridge consciousness is that which tries to find rooted cultural practices that have always been with the singularity. And that has never been lost. It is always there fresh for anyone who wants to look back in any tradition, right? So if you, don't, if you want to go beyond history of philosophy, if you don't, don't want to think of Kabir and others as just mere figures in the whole massive history of uh, human thought and take them really seriously, take their challenges seriously, then you will find something new. And that newness is what I call bridge consciousness. Right? There is a new, fresh thing always there, never lost. So the ecclesias and the anamnesis that calls you back and demands that you don't forget is there in every culture that allows you to go back. Each moment, right now, we can find infinitude in us, but we have been taught, we have been carefully educated to believe that we are very finite, narrow human beings that have only possibility in economic salvation, that have to find our salvation in economic categories. That is a carefully uh, brainwashed, and I argue that in the book, brainwashed status, in which we do not believe we, are, we have plenty, plen plenitude in us, and that you have to find, you have to depend on all these he cultural heroes, Bill Gates and others, to deliver, give us secular salvation. Now, this is the thing, central thing I attack in the book, the idea of the secular salvation. So we move in, in, for a few thousand years in that book from transcendental salvation to secular salvation. And therefore, we move from secularism, secular, secularity, to a different kind of understanding of being in the world. Now, being in the world is not you and me. It challenges individuality, individualism, modernity. All that falls under the scrutiny and all the categories by which we have been carefully trained by elite thinking. And I also blame, sorry to say, the elites for being the major culprits in trying to secularize the world and give us a, uh, uh, the katagma as the basics, basic way of thinking about the world. Simple folk rarely, you know, have had a voice in this. They have, their categories have been gradually removed by the elites. Because if you can, if I can make you believe that you are, you are, you know, you need something, I'm made, right? I have to make you first believe that you are not full and you need something. Right? And you know that. It's happening all the time. All around you it's happening. Anyway, so secular salvation is, uh, is that salvation that promises uh, or, deli or delivery or deliverance through this katagma, through one-sided katagma, one-sided this thing of the katagma, by denying or suppressing or making invisible the other side. I'm not saying that there's some kind of a conspiracy. This is not a, this is not a conspiracy theory. But 
there is a gravity. There is a gravitational force that naturally pushes the world towards one side of the katagma and not towards the other side of the katagma because for a thousand years we have ignored the call, the ecclesias or the, the demand for anamnesis or do not forget. So that is the basic uh, structure of the book, bare bones structure. There is of course obviously a lot of details and so on. I have already overshot my time. So, so uh, thank you for the ideas you've placed before us and thank you for your eloquence. I'm sure there'll be questions, comments, even contestation. Good, of course. I'm so sure. uh, any comments, any questions? Do you have eggs and all that? <laughs> Stones, eggs to throw at me. Tomatoes. Okay. Huh. fetishism of the, the concepts. So, if I am not wrong, that's probably there because we also have this fetishism of making sense of things. For example, I go through an experience today and then after a few days I probably have to explain it not only to me or to somebody. Right. So, when there is the question of other person, there is somebody else with whom I may have to be in conversation regarding that experience or even with myself. So, can we as human beings do away with that tendency or fetishism of making sense of things? Sir, I understand your question and your concern. I am not saying that just because this was suppressed and privileged, pri this was privileged, now we should do the other way. Now we should throw away all concepts and only focus on the transcendence. No, no, no. I am not saying that. I am simply saying, putting one thing before you, that there is a partial reality in which concept fetishism has, has become this holds the central stage and our whole minds are almost controlled by what kind of image making you can do in the mind, thought can do, all right. I am not suggesting that that side now be wiped out and only this side be privileged, no, no. That would be doing exactly what the uh, other thing had done, right. All I am saying is that there has to be a new relationship between this and that between this side and that side, between the two halves of the katagma. That's all. And how we do it, how anybody can do that will uh, depend on several factors, depending on the culture that you come from, the kind of social and social memory and cultural memory and social experience your group has, right. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that for, com obviously for communication and so on, for teaching communication, uh, and a clarification, you require concepts. How can you, how can we deny concepts? Yes, sir. Kostu, I am not sure I understood. So, my, my, my question could be somewhat, it, it seems to be a romantic view of the origin of culture and two things in which I could not get, what could be the life without, social life, without concepts, how do we know that there was a moment of singularity? Is it an imagination, is it a poetic imagination or are there some kind of uh, signs left behind by that moment of singularity? How do we know that there was a moment of singularity well, yeah, and we are not imagining it now? No, we are not imagining it. We have several signs in, in the Buddhist Maha Satipatthana uh, Sutra, there are several pointers towards that singularity. The, the Buddha went on speaking about the singularity in multiple ways, um, tried to make his bhikshus understand to how to go beyond the concept, how to destroy the concept. Uh, he did not say that we do not need concepts. He said that to, uh, there, there is, there is a moment for the concept and there is a moment for negation of the concept. So we have in history, it is not romantic, it is very ontological, I would argue. It is nothing to do with romance. We have incredible amount of evidence. We have the evidence of, 
of 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 the of the um, of the Buddha, we have the evidence of uh, of the Christ. Where uh, the, how do we know about the Christ? Because Paul, if you examine his letters, letters to the Romans, letters to the Thessalonians, letters to uh, Corinthians, and so on, he goes on repeating about different ways of talking about that singularity of what he experienced, that moment of experience, experiencing the Christ. So he talks about so uh, throughout. Uh, cultural history, we have uh, incredible amount of ontological evidence that that was not romantic. It was a transformative moment. It was a metanoic moment. It was a moment in which human being had the capacity to become God. And so it is not something that can be wished away and dismissed as poetic or romantic. I don't accept it. The second thing is that I am not saying anywhere that we should do without concept. Immediately this happens. I, moment I say it, people think that I'm saying we should not have concept. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the concept has its place, should not be fetishized. It has, but it must know how to live in conjunction with the transcendental. You cannot have only f concepts ruling your life. If you do, this is what will happen. This is, you will have a society like this, a brutal, mad, uh, the most corrupt, society because corruption means rupture. The root of the word corruption is rupture, to break, that katagma. Nobody who has wholeness, a tasted wholeness for a moment would want to be corrupt. But only when you have katagma, when you live on one side of the relationship, then you want to dominate the world, dominate others, uh, grab as much petroleum from the ground, uh, become... Now today, eight Indians, as you must have seen the Oxfam report, eight Indians own 60% of the country's wealth, and 64 people in the world own 60% of the world's wealth. That is a kind of schizophrenic, neurotic society in which we live, and that is, not, is nothing to do with uh, uh, romanticism. It is to do with an ont ontological failure. What we are seeing today is a catastrophic ontological failure. Now, it is not only Pakistan who is, which is a failed state, as we often claim. All over the world, we, have, we are facing failed states. I'm sorry to say this in front of young people. We are facing failed states not only in Pakistan, but everywhere. And that failed state is because we are facing an ontological fracture of such a profound degree that we cannot even... We are not even able to face it and look at it and immediately want to dismiss it as some kind of uh, romantic, um, you know, imagination. Uh, I mean, uh, that I'm imagining the opposite. You don't have to imagine the opposite. You have enough traces throughout every culture. There are enough traces that show you what that singularity, I use the word singularity. Did Muhammad use singularity? No, he had his own terminology for it. Uh, when he's talking about, when if you read the Quran and you're talking about the, uh, his meeting with the um, archangel, your, your hair on your body will start rising. Uh, Einstein was asked once uh, whether the Christ was a historical figure to him. And Einstein, you know what Einstein replied? Do you know something? I'm a Jew. But to me, when I read the Christ, the Sermon on the Mount, every hair on my body stands up. And I cannot deny the truth of it. And therefore, of course, how can you even ask me this question whether the Christ was a historical figure? Of course he was. He's, you know, so, uh, um, and he said that, uh, anyway, he said many things. Um, so, 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 yeah, so there is uh, an ontological truth here, not romanticism. Yes, sir? disagree with your values when you say that love is the center of all development. That's a very nice way of putting it. The, uh, regarding your uh, larger argument, uh, I have a couple of thoughts. One is that uh, I was wondering whether you have given us a complete picture of either humanism or the secular mind. Because to equate humanism with only conceptual uh, operations is not to do justice to the idea of humanism or to the idea of secular understanding of human being, completely agree, completely argue that human beings are built of emotions, aesthetics, activities of all kinds, concepts are one part of that. 
therefore, to from the from the, the critique of concepts to move to the critique of secularism and humanism, I'm not seeing how that is happening. Why? Because then I've left out large parts of my argument. Yeah. So maybe I need to read your book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so I'm not seeing those connections being established. The uh, stick with point size. So that was the first. The second is when you look at. Uh, uh, for example, the violences of today's society, yeah. uh, the kind of uh, genocide we are seeing, the kind of intolerance we are seeing. To argue, therefore, that all of these come from uh, uh, secular thought or secular practices, if that is your argument. Mm -hmm. uh, suppressing the other dimension. Not suppressing the argument, even by suppressing, uh, suppressing the non-conceptual. Yeah. The non uh, by suppressing the non-conceptual uh, is not enough of an argument. Because there will be all kinds of processes happening over there, including you'll find enormous elaboration of concepts by those who seek to justify the killing of others. The and enormous emphasis on emotion and aesthetics by those who justify the killing of others. So just to say that it is the rise of the non conceptual is not enough of an argument. I need a better understanding of why this is happening. The third and last big point is when you talk of uh, singularity, and uh, uh, offering a completeness and a wholeness. Uh, that is one way of looking at it. And the I wonder how you respond to the secular explanation of that, which is the idea of the divine, the idea of singularity, the idea of the sacred, is a human construct, which we create at some, for a variety of reasons, to make sense of things, to, to deal with things. It need not be an actual correspondence with reality. It too is a partial correspondence with reality. It's another way of looking at that. And how would you respond to this third thing? <laughs> you see, humanism is also a way of reconstructing the human being from within the signs and symbols, symbols that we ourselves have invented. Humanism is a 700, 800 thousand year process within which we have reinvented the human being in a uh, more, uh, what should I say? We have cut the cloth, uh, cut the, how, how do you say that? Uh, cut the suit according to the cloth, right? And humanism is also the invention of signs, symbols, uh, you know, um, understandings and so on, within which, for instance, the major philosopher of the 20th century, Charles Taylor, on whose also work I rely, he shows in a massive book how we, in, 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 in about a 800 years period, human beings reinvent within Latin, of course he's talking about Latin Christendom, uh, reinvent themselves uh, within a structure. And, and therefore, when you come out of, when you, when you are a product of that humanism, you no longer can see that transcendental as something real. For you it is, there, then uh, it is something that we have made up. So we have made up the Christ and his transcendence. We have made up the Buddha. <laughs> and this moment of uh, enlightenment. We have, we have made up all this. You know, in its essential effect, that's what you're really saying. You're denying the ontological truth of that transcendence because we are afraid to face it because we want to dominate we, some, some of us who have, made, who have made it, who have made it intellectually, want to keep our, um, our safe uh, domains uh, uh, we, because we have, concepts have made us. And therefore, but, but humanism is really a recreation of the human being within that system. Therefore, you can no longer then see beyond that system. And because, and therefore anything that goes beyond it, we immediately challenge as, uh, you know, this is, this is also that. We drag it, we drag that thing also into this. And we, what, what is called a process of transcendental reductionism. It's a, it's, a, it's a peculiar process of transcendental reductionism by which we reduce something that our minds cannot conceive as something that is made up. What was Kabir talking about? Made up. Right? Every breath, he said, he says, Sain to tere saans mein. The transcendent is in every breath, on, on your every lip. Huh? We don't examine that. He said, we don't, it's not a challenge thrown to me. Let me find out what he means by that, right? For we just read it as a um, string of symbols, and then we make it into poetry, and then we say we have done our justice to it. We don't find out 
what did he really mean by the fact, by that statement that method um, renaissance may. It is no longer a challenge to us, but physics is a challenge. Quantum mechanics is a challenge because they're real. They modify the world. They can explode the world ground from beneath your feet. Kabir is not real in that sense of E is equal to MC square. And my argument is that he is exactly as real as E is equal to MC square. And that's where I have problem with intellectuals because I'm examining and I'm uh, questioning and I am sometimes, um, what should I say, uh, critiquing the very intellectual categories through which we have created humanism. Because I'm sure we'll come back to you if we have time. Yeah. Yeah? Back to uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Sure. Uh, I have a question, which of course is a politically correct way of telling that I have an opinion and you must tell us what to it. So, um, now, if we look at uh, the idea of religious fundamentalism, I think it's uh, core injunction is. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. Uh, it's its uh, core injunction is thou shall not, right? As in uh, um, religious fundamentalism exercises prohibitions and it places restrictions on what a person cannot do. Thou shall not remove your parda, thou shall not marry beyond your community, thou shall not uh, break caste rules and so on. On the other hand, we have liberal permissiveness which is summarized by yes we can. Right? You know, yes, we can have multiple partners, yes, we can have Pepsi, Coke, and organic food at the same time, and whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, somewhere I think these are not exactly two different poles, but actually part of the yeah. very same uh, <laughs> dimension. In fact, I, I argue that. You know, I say, I show that religious fundamentalism is an exact product of the suppression of the religious. If you suppress the, the other side, it will, it will not go away. Everything in this world is conserved. Nothing goes away. You can't wish it away. You can't wish away uh, the religious feelings. But they is good. they're going to come out in distorted ways. And they're going to express themselves as fundamentalism, extremism, which are, like you're arguing, is the other side of that same story. But maybe there is an alternative behind liberal permissiveness and fundamentalism. That is what I often do. It's exactly what I tried to say, that religious fundamentalism and extremism is a, a reaction to liberal thought and it is a, it's a distorted way of how, you know, you know uh, if you have read Freud and if you have read Jung and so on, it is a, a clear, uh, to my mind, a, a clearly distorted eruption in, Ill, in, in, you know, in dangerous ways that show itself as social malady, a social disease, right? And they are not going to go away by making more uh, military, uh, you know, responses or doing something else or, you know, creating more uh, instant reaction troops and all that. That is one way of, uh, but it is a very limited way of doing it. <laughs> that suppression is not going to go away. It is going to come out as malady. And that's what we are seeing today. Sir. Yes, sir. Science also has a moment of singularity. Science? Singularity. 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 Okay. Of course. And uh, we see. I mean, I like the way you're handling the notion of fetishism. You know? yeah. And we see the fetishism of procedure as the moment of singularity mm -hmm. uh, loses its conviction. The rituals of science take precedence over realization. Correct. As in both points of power. So what I mean is that I don't necessarily want to confine myself to the illustrations that we use from Buddhism or Christianity or whatever. Okay. You know? Okay. So if we, and again if I say secularize the discussion, I am damning <laughs> myself. <laughs> but uh, even within political thought, I mean the notion of revolution yeah. also has a singularity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you see a transformation taking place right. without it being called and felt as a revolution, <coughs> when history goes presents itself. presents itself. And then the rituals of uh, fetishism of revolution. Okay. Because 
uh, the notion of revolution itself is wedded to capitalism as a mode which seeks to transform itself to revolution. So you are making a broad thesis. Yes. And uh, the argument is, to my mind, very convincing in the sense that uh, the one-sidedness yeah. of the nature of the scientific conviction, scientific rationality, you know, scientific rationality. Uh, as it loses its moments of conviction, yes. the alternatives start up asserting themselves in distorted, total <coughs> forms exactly. because they have been suppressed. Yes. But then where do we go from here? Because I don't see myself uh, uh, being able to, maybe it's my indoctrination. <laughs> you said I should suspend my indoctrination yes. for a while. <laughs> for a brief while. <laughs> for a brief while. <laughs> but I am not able to suspend that indoctrination. Uh, if at all, there has to be a moment of singularity which I need to experience in a moment of transcendence that I have to experience, it would have to be from the point at which I am located and which I consider to be the firm feet of ground on which I am planted. Not on the firm ground that Jesus was planted on. No, 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 no. I understand you perfectly, your question. Yeah. But I, I don't think that the book does full justice to that question mm -hmm. uh, for other reasons. Uh, because um, uh, there are there are certain kinds of limitations uh, that I had to uh, impose myself on myself in, in the writing of the book and left out certain things. Um, I, I truly, uh, apart from microsocial, just a little bit of touching upon microsocial praxis, metanoic praxis, I, I, I don't think I have given uh, too much room in the book to how, uh, you know, it should not become something like do it yourself, kind of, you know. No, no, it can't be programmatic either, huh. nor can it be like. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As an idiopathic yeah, exercise. Yeah, that's right. idiopathic yeah. exercise, correct. I've try, tried to touch upon it from a cultural angle, from broad cultural angles. I've examined uh, Kabir, I've examined various other, um, you know, um, thinkers as to, in a very general way, you know, taking their thoughts seriously. What would happen if you did not treat them as philosophy? I treated them as phenomenological challenge, challenge thrown at you. What would happen? How would you look at it? You know, I've, in fact, I've gone back to the, uh, to the um, Sermon on the Mount and given an ontological, uh, ontological understanding of the Sermon on the Mount, sermon by sermon. Tried to see what would it mean in our lives if we took it seriously and not taking it as faith or belief or let us pray or let us do something, but actually a, a, a challenge to the human conduct. So I've done that a little bit, but I cannot say I've done full justice to it. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering about the possibility of this kind of trans, transcendence. Okay. Okay. Some of them, I'm still able to connect with it. Yeah. But when I am reading the Shatapata Brahmana, okay. hmm? yeah. I am reading those rituals, Oh, okay. Each ritual, as for that priest at that particular point of time, each ritual had meaning, conviction, yes. and carried through a life agreed, experience. Agreed. Agreed. I cannot enter that. No, but you, you will have something that I'm, I've argued that you may not be able to enter that satipatthana, or, or you may not be able to that particular brahmana, or something like that. But in every culture, there is something for everybody, and we have to find them. It says obviously that those rituals may be empty for you you will not be able to find what the priest found in that moment. But there are things that you may not find. And that search is something that is important, I have indicated. So you, you haven't done a primer for Kundendu, uh -huh. but there is scope for reflection part two. Yes, <laughs> reflection part two. Uh, <laughs> well, after, after the yeah, one sec, yeah. yeah. It was just a kind of uh, loud thing. Uh, one minor comment and then one question. I will comment which uh, Fulendu also mentioned. This violence, criticism of concept, this is useful for it, even if one has to think about your entire thesis. Because uh, I tend to believe on every day basis we try to deal with it. When we say even in our classroom discussion that the term like culture is constructed. It's historically constructed, it's uh, constructed through various through various cultural resources itself, right? So Criticism of uh, concept is a useful concept for me. Right? Uh, when you talk about this, uh, you know, uh, fragmentation or relativization, there is one standard story of this relativization that 
you, once you come out of your culture, you can see that there are multiple realities. Wow. Now, the logical uh, problem, if I may say, I can see in your, uh, whatever you presented, no one has to comment on the book, but it's pretty much yeah, yeah, on the presentation. That you, are, you yourself are mentioning that there are three, four different moments of similarity. If there are more than one moment of singularity, then mathematically speaking, it's, it's already re relativization. There are three, four different no, no, moments. No, no, I didn't mean that. I meant that each culture has its, this each culture has its moments of singularity. I'm sorry. Thousands years religious war. Yeah. Well, you know, of course, one can analyze that war historically, but you know, war over the truth. So there is already relativization even before this moment of what you say cutting. I, I, I don't think I fully understood. Okay, let me uh, respond to the earlier part. Yeah. When we talk about singularity, we are talking in, 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 we should not reduce it to another mathematical understanding of singularity, right? That there are no multiple singularities, two singularities would be contradictory there and so on. We are talking about singularities in an ontological, philosophical sense, right? Where there is no category no discovery of category any longer, you don't need a category to, because it is beyond your thought. A moment that thought cannot reach is how we define singularity here, right? Not in terms of quantum mechanics. Now, every culture can have... We can have Pepsi, Coke and organic food at the same time and whatever. Now, somewhere I think these are not exactly two different poles, but actually part of the yeah. very same dimension. Uh, <laughs> I, I argue that. No, I say, I show that religious fundamentalism is an exact product of the suppression of the religious. Right. If you suppress the, the other side, it will, it will not go away. Everything in this world is conserved. Nothing goes away. You can't wish it away. You can't wish away uh, the religious feelings, but they are going to come out in distorted ways. And they're going to express themselves as fundamentalism, extremism, which are, like you're arguing, is the other side of that same story. But maybe there is an alternative behind liberal permissiveness and fundamentalism. That is what I often do. It's exactly what I tried to say, that religious fundamentalism and extremism is a, a reaction to liberal thought. And it is a, it's a distorted way of how, you know, you know uh, if you have read Freud, and if you have read Jung and so on, it is a, a clear, uh, to my mind, a, a clearly distorted eruption in, Ill, in, in, you know, in dangerous ways that show itself as social malady, a social disease, right? And they are not going to go away by making more uh, military, uh, you know, responses or doing something else or you know, creating more uh, instant reaction troops and all that. That is one way of, uh, but it is a very limited way of doing it. <laughs> that suppression is not going to go away. It is going to come out as malady. And that's what we are seeing today. Sir. Yes, sir. Science also has a moment of singularity. Science? Singularity. 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 Okay. Of course. And uh. we see, I mean, I like the way you are handling the notion of fetishism. Yeah. And we see the fetishism of procedure as the moment of singularity uh, loses its conviction. The rituals of science take precedence over realization. Correct. As in both points of power. So what I mean is that I don't necessarily want to confine myself to the illustrations that we use from Buddhism or Christianity or whatever. Okay. Okay. So if we, and again if I say secularize the discussion, I am damning myself. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, even within critical thought, I mean the notion of revolution yeah. also has a singularity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you see a transformation taking place right. without it being called and felt as a revolution, <coughs> then history goes presents itself. presents itself. And then the rituals of uh, fetishism of revolution. Okay. Because 
uh, the notion of revolution itself is wedded to capitalism as a mode which seeks to transform itself to revolution. So you are making a broader thesis. Yes. And uh, the argument is, to my mind, very convincing in the sense that uh, the one-sidedness yeah. of the nature of the scientific conviction, scientific, the rationality, you know, scientific rationality. Uh, as it loses its moments of conviction, yes. the alternatives start up asserting themselves in distorted forms <coughs> exactly. because they have been suppressed. Yes. But then where do we go from here? Because I don't see myself uh, uh, being able to, maybe it's my indoctrination. <laughs> you said I should suspend my indoctrination yeah. for a while. <laughs> for a brief while. For a brief <laughs> while. <laughs> but I'm not able to suspend that indoctrination. Uh, if at all, there has to be a moment of singularity which I need to experience in a moment of transcendence that I have to experience, it would have to be from the point at which I am located and which I consider to be the firm feet of ground on which I am planted. Not on the firm ground that Jesus was planted on. No, 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 no. I understand you perfectly, your question. Yeah. But I, I don't think that the book does full justice to that question uh, for other reasons uh, because um, uh, there are there are certain kinds of limitations uh, that I had to uh, impose myself on myself in, in the writing of the book and left out certain things. Um, I, I truly, uh, apart from microsocial, just a little bit of touching upon microsocial praxis, metanoic praxis, I, I, I don't think I've given uh, too much room in the book to how, uh, you know, it should not become something like do it yourself, kind of, you know. No, no, it's not the programmatic either, huh. nor can it be like the yeah. same. Yeah. As an idiopathic yeah, exercise. Yeah, that's the idiopathic exercise, exercise. correct. I've try, tried to touch upon it from a cultural angle, from broad cultural angles. I've examined uh, Kabir, I've examined various other, um, you know, um, thinkers as to, in a very general way, you know, taking their thoughts seriously. What would happen if you did not treat them as philosophy? I treated them as phenomenological challenge, challenge thrown at you. What would happen? How would you look at it? You know, I've, in fact, I've gone back to the, uh, to the um, Sermon on the Mount and given an ontological, uh, ontological understanding of the Sermon on the Mount, sermon by sermon. Try to see what would it would mean in our lives if we took it seriously and not taking it as faith or belief or let us pray or let us do something, but actually a, a, a challenge to the human conduct. So I've done that little bit, but I cannot say I've done full justice to it. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering about the possibility of this kind of trans, transcendence. Okay. Now, I'm still able to connect with him. Yeah. But when I'm reading the Shatapata Brahmana, okay. hmm? yeah. I'm reading those rituals, Oh, okay. Each ritual, as for that priest at that particular point of time, each ritual had meaning, conviction, yes. and carried through a life agreed, experience. Agreed. Agreed. I cannot enter that. Territory. No, but you you will have something that I'm, I've argued that you may not be able to enter that satipatthana, or, or you may not be able to that particular brahmana, or something like that. But in every culture, there is something for everybody, and we have to find them. It says obviously that those rituals may be empty for you. You will not be able to find what the priest found in that moment. But there are things that you may not find. And that search is something that is important, I have indicated. So you, you haven't done a primer for, for Lindu, uh -huh. but there is scope for reflection part two. Yes, <laughs> reflection part two. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, one sec. Yeah. Yeah. So just a kind of uh, loud thing. Uh, one minor comment and then one question. I will comment which Sunandu uh, also mentioned. This while as criticism of concept, which is useful for it, even if one has to think about your entire thesis. Because uh, I tend to believe on every day basis we try to deal with it. When we say even in our classroom discussion that the term like culture is constructed, which is historically constructed, it's uh, constructed through various through various cultural resources itself, right? So Criticism of uh, concept is a useful concept for me. Right? Uh, when you talk about this, uh, you know, uh, fragmentation or relativization, there is one standard story of this relativization that you, once you come out of your culture.
difference, and you can see that there are multiple realities. Wow. Now, the logical uh, problem, if I may say, I can see in your, uh, whatever you presented, and one has to comment on the book, but it's pretty much yeah, 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 on the presentation. That you are, you yourself are considering that there are three, four different moments of similarity. If there are more than one moment of similarity, then mathematically speaking, it's, it's already rel relativization. There are three, four different moments. No, no, moments. no, I didn't mean that. I meant that each culture has its, one, each culture has its moments of singularity. See, thousands of years religious war. I'm sorry? Thousands of years religious war. Yeah. Well, you know, of course, one can analyze that war historically, but you know, war over the truth. So there is already relativization even before this moment of what you say, Katayama. <coughs> I, I, I don't think I fully understood. Okay, let me uh, respond to the earlier part. Yeah. When we talk about singularity, we are talking in, 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 we should not reduce it to another mathematical understanding of singularity, right? That there are no multiple singularities, or two singularities would be contradictory there and so on. We are talking about singularities in an ontological, philosophical sense, right? Where there is no category. No discovery of category any longer. You don't need a category to, because it is beyond your thought. A moment that thought cannot reach is how we define singularity here, right? Not in terms of quantum mechanics. Now, every culture can have not can sorry not can have does have has always based on those moments from where it is exploded. The Greeks have. Exploded. You know, the, the, the Vedic age exploded a particular moment. Um, Christianity exploded from, a, from, from that. We, I mean, look at the literature. The literature tells you that, that was, they, they trace it back to that, that, that moment, that, the, the resurrection or something like that, right? Uh, so uh, it is uh, obsessed. Even today, uh, people are trying to understand what that uh, meant, you know, what that moment meant. Uh, they're trying to uh, deconstruct that moment. So it is in that sense I'm using the word singularity where thought cannot reach. Right? Not in the narrow mathematical sense of singularity. And I think that uh, yes, every culture, every major culture that uh, we see has had its moment of singularity. From where later on has come art, music, explosions, different kinds of uh, debates, discourses, understandings and so on. Multiplicities have come out of a singular moment. We cannot deny, we cannot deny it. At, at least in my analysis, I am unable to deny the fact of singularity. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to say that, but, but I just uh, split myself. Um, because I need to understand that there is this threshold not to say anything, but also that you really want to say something. I just want to refer to uh, this moment also that uh, that, uh, that happens in the Gita, where Krishna offers the divine sight to Arjuna, where the idea of multiplicity also exists. But then, but then Arjuna seems to see the multiplicity at the same time that he sees everything at the same time. It explodes for him, right. and and then kind of uh, some sort of a transformation actually occurs. Yes. But but my point here is a different one. Uh, so the examples that we've taken here, the references we've made to singularity, seems to be these massive references, right? The resurrection, uh, or the Buddha's space of enlightenment, right. uh, or Kabir, etc., right? Yes. Uh, I don't know how the book goes. Uh, is it possible for you to talk to us uh, about, uh, about the singularity that we might be experiencing every day as an individual while I live my life? The uh, Thank you. Uh, I had completely ignored this part. There is a section in the book, in the, in the middle of the book, where there is some, some field work in which I, I traverse several districts in Nodia, uh, in, in interior Bengal, talking to people about their experiences. And some of those narratives are there in the book, where I, uh, you know, I've, I've recorded um, some, not too many. I have, I have the, uh, the, the data, but the book only has four or five such narratives in which the people, people talk about their own experiences of 
Not this, as you rightly said, huge things like resurrection, but where are the singularities in our own lives? And so I've come, I've come upon remarkable um, uh, narratives uh, about how, you know, uh, how people thought, how, how people came upon a moment with which they did, they, um, I mean, they, which, which floored them, which they could not explain, or they did not need to explain it further. It was it, that was it, right? So, there, yeah, there are. There are such moments in our lives uh, which are uh, relevant and important. More than merely flooring them, yes. do they change? I mean, the transform. experience of singularity is a transformative, transformative. for them. See, uh, unfortunately, I uh, did not stay with my subjects for long enough to understand that their uh, what ha entire thing. So it will be too much for me to make that claim. Uh, I could speak to them. I could see their, uh, in some certain ways, how it influenced them and so on. How, uh, but I cannot really vouch for a transformative uh, change. Did they did it. Change their vantage point. Yes, that I can say. Just to say, um, did those transformative movement, movement, moments then transform the lives of those around them? Is in how does this communication happen? I don't know. I don't know, frankly. Again, I would be shooting my, overshooting my mouth if I said yes or no. Uh, frankly, I don't know. I'd, uh, I was thinking of a yeah. poem by Robert Browning. Brown. Uh, I have it in front, in fact. An epistle containing the strange medical experience of Karshish, the Arab physician. Mm. Report of a report of, the, of Lazarus arising from the dead. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. The, the double distancing that Browning does a report of a report mm -hmm. uh, of an incredible of Lazarus, uh, yeah. of Lazarus. And the only evidence that it must be the case is the eyes of Lazarus. Mm. There is no other that this medical physician, medical experience the Arab physician can give except the look that uh, Lazarus It's very interesting see. because someone once asked of, of, uh, a thing about Paul and, and they asked, uh, how do you know Paul is telling the truth? that he had met the Christ. And he said, it is in his eyes. It's very interesting. Other question? There are, there are many gaps, holes, that need to be worked on in the book. Maybe another <laughs> part two. One can think about all this in a, clinic, in a clinical way, you know, that this leads to certain kinds of uh, recuperative moments and all that. I, I, I did not go in that direction, but mainly because philosophically, if you continue to maintain the inner and the outer, it becomes another fresh problem. So I try to go, why am I talking about the inner? Because we are already focused on the outer. Once you are balanced, once you, understand, you bring in the inner, there's neither inner nor outer. Do you see what I'm saying? The, 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 the emphasis we start, the starting point is the analysis of the outer, the concept and so on. And by contrast, we propose the inner. And the inner does not mean inner here. Inner means an awareness of another dimension. That the outer or the conceptual does not allow you. It creates a barrier between the inner. Now, the ending point for me is not continued inner outer. The ending point is a, 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 a bridge consciousness in which the inner and the outer both have disappeared. There is no longer need for that duality. You need this only because you propose that. 
and as long as you maintain that this is this is but if that is gone this is also gone in a very put it in a very simple way so no but i, I it, it is possible like jung for instance does use it therapeutically the idea of the inner outer and so on uh, the idea of the archetype and so on and so forth but my book goes in a different direction it, i don't go in the therapeutic direct direction at all in the clinical so, direction you think of using uh, a certain kind of phraseology yeah partial reality catagma split between inner and outer yeah so keeping this phraseology in mind yeah would you say that you would define singularity or the moment of singularity as as something which overlaps with wholeness yeah i would not uh, contend that is that uh, it's just a, a different language that right. different language that you're using i would not contend that point right other quick questions i would not hold you up for long beyond the time given to me but uh, is there a Haan ji. I was not going to the direction of psychoanalytics, but it's notion of alienation. Alienation. No? Now, alienation is essential for transcendence. It's an essential part of the moment of realization and transcendence. Now, if you look at, see, I'm trained as a historian, history person. I will think historically. I will historicize. That's my orientation. A, a worldview. in which all material actions are shaped by certain cosmic principles ontological principles like a theory of karma yeah. you know theory of like a notion of karma for karma example. yeah 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 huh? i understand now that is a framing which you might call transcendent and which you might call whole in in one sense hmm? now that is also alienating in in a sense that the individual disappears Oh, in that sense. In that sense, the will, in the sense of having autonomy, tends to certain kinds of uh, uh, exercises disappear. Uh, it's it's not a, you know I understand the point that the secularism of science and the humanism in which it is uh, rooted, in, in which it is presented, yeah. that itself is a one-sided representation. Yeah. Hmm? but this representation one sided though it may be has emerged through a process of dialectical contestation with another kind of representation yeah. which has other negative consequences so and and is is not as if okay. the other is fulfilling and whole the other also has its alienating and in many ways <coughs> disempowering sicknesses yes i I don't see the religious and the spiritual worldview as in itself a complete alternative either. I see that too as a fragmented, yeah, and one-sided representation. Um, it is probably because the the so-called religious and the so-called transcendental is also also managed by certain elite. So over time. has become uh, managed by uh, certain forms of elites and you know in terms of organized religion organized religion you see anarchy you have spoken of anarchy with me and anarchy is um, a, 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 a religious anarchy uh, the way for instance Gan a certain kind of uh, if i may use I, i the book does not go in that direction but if you bring in gandhi for instance gandhi's understanding of religious thought was a form, a form of anarchic thought he was not going in the direction of institutionalized religion he did not believe in it and yet he swore by religion swore by the religious and he had the courage to be anarchic about it he did not think that uh, he did not uh, allow the um, uh, existing um, you know um, um, the the mullahs the 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 great uh, patriarchs of religion to interpret religion for him so in, in if you move in that direction now you see it is not possible to give a entire map of this thing what i'm suggesting is that one has to leap in there's a certain leap leap involved once you make that leap the idea of religious transcendence and this and that all all, all of that uh, go away you no longer have to do, need to uh, rely on those uh, you know the uh, props you don't need the props anymore 
So the, 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 the drive is towards a propless uh, movement, the kind of anarchy that Gandhi was talking about, for instance. He was not accepting uh, religion in the institutionalized manner, right? Half a minute more. That we need to <laughs> 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 well, I, I Before we all start dispersing, I really want to thank you all for coming because it's a precious time I know you invest and uh, I hope I have not wasted your time. Okay. So, so thank you for a uh, very different kind of opportunity. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Without you, nothing. So thank you for a different kind of opportunity for reflection. Reflection. But Huh. You know, <laughs> even I have not received a copy yet. <laughs> huh, my uh, complimentary copy has not arrived. They promised it in the third week and that's why I promised. US price or India price? US I don't have an Indian edition, man. <laughs> so, yeah, it's very expensive. Don't even think about it. I can't afford it. I told my brother to send a copy from us. <laughs> uh, I have asked the uh, library to uh, get two copies. I'll give you my, my copy, okay? I'll get it. Yeah, I don't need to put it. Uh, yeah, quite right, quite right. You're right, I, I agree. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ninja, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. We'll see, your, your presence itself changes everything. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir.